People are often offended by the God is dead idea in Nietzsche. But this is strange because they don't even know what it means. In fact, it's not even obvious what it means. It's contradictory. Let's talk about what it means. Have you ever been in this situation? The God is dead concept comes up in conversation and someone gets offended and balks and says, oh, what a terrible thing to say. I can't believe that he would say something like that. But what does it mean? Why would they get offended? It's a straightforward contradiction. The way that we customarily think about God is as an eternal, infinite being. Eternal beings are beyond death. The idea of death is not even compatible with the idea of God. And so this is like saying the deathless has died, the eternal has died, the atemporal is temporal, the infinite is finite. It's a contradiction, or at least a paradox. So what is he doing here? I mean, did Nietzsche just make a basic logical error? Surely not. We have to give him more credit than that. So maybe it was just slander. Maybe he was just trying to be offensive in any way possible. That's a curious way to do it, and we can't discount that completely, so we'll return to that. But that can't be all that, that's going on here. There must be something better happening. And there is. So what did he really mean by this? What he meant is that authentic faith in God is no longer a living option for people. That the old paradigm of divine providence, faith in God, and living where the very foundation of your existence and way of understanding yourself and the world can no longer be based upon the old conception of God. And what he's telling us is that culture has shifted. And because culture has shifted, there are certain things that we can't believe necessarily. And what this means is that we are not free to believe whatever we want to believe. Nietzsche is going to make this claim just like Kant would, that our ability to believe is circumscribed by our upbringing, our culture, our worldview. The fundamental components of that worldview make certain things unbelievable, not capable of being believed. And so this is really what's going on. In the older worldview, in the medieval system, so thinking late medieval world, early Renaissance, we start seeing a transition. And this transition could not be more monumental or consequential for the development of the modern world, but at the same time, it's also rarely spoken of. And you get it occasionally in anthropology and philosophy. And, um, you know, as a historian of philosophy, and this is my particular area, I'm, of course, very interested in this kind of thing. But also, it pains me to hear histories being told without emphasizing this particular piece. Because this shift from a world that is based upon divine providence, where God is at the bedrock of our understanding of self and world, to a world where the individual is at the bedrock of world and self-understanding. That could not be more significant. So let's explore this a little bit further. For the medievals and during the Renaissance, the old paradigm, decreasing in the Renaissance and then arguably fully gone by the time we get to the Reformation, and the Reformation itself is actually an indication that this, is, uh, this transformation has already occurred. And we'll see why. So the old paradigm is that God is first. God is being. We're told that, you know, God is being itself. This is one of the names of God that's mentioned in Exodus. God is he who is. And so God is being itself and is at the absolute fabric, the absolute foundation of being. And so if God is at the most fundamental level of being, then, well, first of all, there can be no doubt, right? There can be no need for belief. There is no need for the kind of logical argumentation and proofs for the existence of God and that sort of thing, because to doubt that would be just to doubt existence itself. And nobody really did that in the first millennium. And so that wasn't a problem because the entire world was understood through the lens of the divine. Now, as we approach the late medieval world and then into the Renaissance, this starts to change. 
and we start to see a shift. And the shift is marked by an emphasis on the increased transcendence of God. So God is thought to be and becomes the Deus absconditus, so the hidden God, the one who is not accessible by any means. This is a God that you can't know, you can't get at, uh, you can't have any evidently meaningful contact with, knowledge with. And so this is a God that becomes accessible by faith alone because everything else has been eliminated. Now, this is in strong contrast to what we get only a few centuries earlier. I mean, this is really obvious in someone like Eriugena. So there, God is imminent in everything. God is experienced in absolutely everything. You walk outside and every little bit of existence is just shot through with the divine. And so to know the world, to live and breathe and experience the world was to experience God. There's no room even for doubt in that sort of system, much less a call for belief. But this changes over time, and as God becomes an increasingly transcendent, increasingly distant thing, then it becomes more of a possibility that, well, maybe I don't have any direct experience of God when I'm dealing with individual physical things in the world and people and the weather and everything else. So how can I then be certain of anything that the priest is telling me that I'm you know, encountering in the Bible, later reading uh, in the Bible? So fast forward a little bit to the time of Descartes and now, you know, in the couple of centuries leading up to Nietzsche, instead of hearing about a God-first world with Descartes, Descartes' hyperbolic doubt doubts everything and tries to begin by building from the ground up. Well, he builds from the ground up, not based upon God, but based upon his own existence. And so Descartes' own existence, this solipsistic, I know my own mind, I think therefore I am, that is is not based on divine providence. So we can tell, you know, by the early 1600s, this is already gone, that the divine providence uh, foundation for culture has already shifted. And so a couple of hundred years later, this development has continued further and further. We have more philosophical systems that are built in the model of, in the shadow of Descartes, trying to... Um, rescue some kind of certainty, some kind of knowledge, and then, of course, some kind of ethics, some kind of religion, and so on. And so by the time we get to Nietzsche, there is a distinct sense that the skepticism of someone like David Hume, uh, which is, you know, Descartes uh, taken to a new extreme, the skepticism that led through doubt to question everything and not begin with God has resulted in a world where we don't have any defensible means of purpose, of value, of knowledge. And so we're left with nihilism. And nihilism ultimately is the greatest threat for someone like Nietzsche. So nihil nihilism refers to a vacuum of me meaning. The word nihilism comes from nihil, which means, this is the Latin for nothing. And so it is a vast nothingness. We have nothing to build on. Whereas the medievals and the ancient Christians would have started with God. God was being. We're going to start with being. Simple. But by the time we get to Nietzsche, this is not the dominant paradigm. This is not what we get from culture. And so if he goes along with someone like Kant, which he does in this case, that our belief is actually circumscribed, it's actually limited. What it is that we even can believe is limited by our cultural inheritance, by our upbringing. The things that have molded the basic ways in which we see the world, the ways that we see ourself as different from, at first, the mother, and then different from the rest of the world, and then how we differentiate ourselves. Does my mind count fully as myself? Do my emotions count fully as myself? And culture continually reinforces all of these things via, of course, language, but all of the interactions that we have. The very grammar of our sentences reinforces this. And so this is something that is at a very fundamental level of the way that we view self and world. And so what Nietzsche is saying is that that foundation, 
the strength of that foundation is not the sort of thing that we can just choose to believe in something different. And so what he's really saying is that something fundamental metaphysically has shifted. So our conception of what the world is, what we are, what we are in relation to the world, what our mind is, what our thoughts are, what value things have, these are all fundamental level things that are not easily, if at all, changed. And they're certainly not the sort of thing that we can just decide that we're going to have an authentic faith in the way that we could in previous centuries. That's what's really going on with the God is dead concept. Now, let's take a look at a couple of passages. And this is frequently what people have in mind. So we have the longer passage from the gay science, and then we have the shorter but famous passage from this book, Zarathustra. So with Zarathustra, he's coming down from the mountain, from his airy. And uh, this is in the prologue. Zarathustra leaves the old saint that he meets. And, uh, and we read, But when Zarathustra was alone, he spoke thus to his heart. Could it be possible this old saint has not heard in his forest that God is dead? And then later, dead are all the gods. Now we want the Superman to live, the overman uh, to live. So this is more of a, a call to action in Zarathustra, but it's also a recognition of, you know, this old saint who is living with the old ways, living as if he could still be a medieval living as if he could still live in a world of divine providence. Has he not heard? Has no one told him that that worldview just doesn't work anymore? That what he's doing is trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, and there's nothing but discomfort that can come from that. It just doesn't, it doesn't work in a way. It's like trying to enjoy music that you don't like. <laughs> it's like trying to enjoy a food that you don't like. You know, you're sitting there chewing on it, it's like, yeah, this is good. It's hard to fake that kind of thing. And ultimately, it may not be the kind of thing that we even can fake. I can't choose to like a different kind of music. I can't choose to like mushrooms. Um, there are certain things that are just beyond my power in terms of a kind of aesthetic uh, judgment. And so it may be that fundamental elements of our metaphysical worldview are like this, and perhaps even more so like this, insofar as there are implications for what it even means to be a self in the world. Okay, now let's take a look at the passage from the gay science. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? Okay, there's not a single throwaway detail in this passage. And this is chock full of history. And if you're not aware of the history, a lot of this isn't going to make any sense. And it's going to seem like, you know, what in the world is he talking about? Why would he say that? So let's dive in a bit. So God remains, God is dead, but not only is God dead, but we've killed him. So we are understood to be the kind of thing that has the power to kill God. That, setting aside that it's a paradox, that at least puts us on par with the divine. And he reinforces this later on by saying, is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become God simply to be worthy of it, to appear to be worthy of it? So that actually, that idea has a history. And the idea that we are to become gods, that God became man so that man might become God. So that has an orthodox theological tradition. But as we get later into, especially the Renaissance with someone like Nicholas of Cusa, we hear that man is quasi alios deus, as a second god. And then later on with someone like Giordano Bruno, Bruno, who was burned at the stake in 1600, in February of 1600, um, and you can, see, you can still see his statue in the Campo di Fiori in, uh, in Rome. Bruno 
tells us that man can replace the role, can usurp, if you like, the role of Christ. And so this is as if saying man is going to take his place in the Trinity. <laughs> so becoming God. Now, it was, it was thought before this that it didn't make any sense for man to become God. In fact, this is one of the things that the Greeks and the Romans didn't like about Christianity. They objected to Christianity in the earliest years because it was a contradiction. How could you have someone who was both divine and human? That doesn't make any sense. In Plato's system, that doesn't make any sense. You've got someone who is, you know, eternal at the same time that you are temporal, you know, huh? Um, so they didn't care for that very much. Later on, of course, the idea that, you know, man might take over the position of Christ, I mean, that's pretty obviously blasphemy, if anything is, right? Um, uh, anyway, the story of Bruno is, is fraud and, and a side issue for us. But nevertheless, that man should be able to take over the place of Christ and be worthy of taking over the place of Christ, that is a testament to the what I have called the inflation of the individual. In other words, the value of the individual and the conception of the individual life is something that has grown over time to include more things, to include not only emotions, moral agency, and responsibility by the time of Pythagoras, and then on to where even, you know, God can be said to, uh, to love and perhaps even to die. Because obviously part of the reference here is a kind of dying on the cross. The cross isn't mentioned, but he does say that we have killed him and all that the world has yet owned is bled to death under our knives. And so it is a graphic image that is uh, at the same time meant to recall a specific piece of Christianity. And so it's, it's interesting. And so he goes on to say, what water is there for us to clean ourselves? In other words, how can we undergo any kind of purgation? How can we purify ourselves of this? Uh, what festivals of atonement? What sacred game shall we have to invent? In other words, what kind of mythology can we have? This is a crucial piece of this passage. What kind of religion can we possibly have? What can we do now in the wake of the death of God? If we take Nietzsche at his word that authentic faith in God as the bedrock of and metaphysical foundation of worldview, if that is no longer a viable option, and we are now stuck with a kind of Cartesian, you know, the self is at the basis of our uh, metaphysical foundation and our, our worldview. And so thought, with our thought, we create the world. And, you know, that's all that we can know. But maybe we can rescue the noumenal world. I'm kind of stepping through philosophical history here. Um, so what can we do now? What kind of sacred games can we invent? What, what kind of rituals? What kind of mythology can we actually have in the face of the death of God? And of course, the answer for that, for Nietzsche, is going to be, now going back to Zarathustra, the Superman, the Overman, the Ubermensch. We desire the Superman to live. And so Nietzsche is this kind of prophet of the Superman in the sense that this is the new hero. This is the new archetype for one who can live and knows how to live in a godless world. And this is specifically someone who does something that would have been heresy a long time, uh, a long time ago in the medieval world, and that is creating. Creating one's own values, creating one's own mythology. And so that is the paradigm in which the, uh, the Ubermensch functions. So one other thing that we should expand on is the idea of a living option, a living option for belief, a living option for mythology and religion and ritual and practice, and then ultimately values. Because presumably, it's implicit in Nietzsche's idea of creating values that we are going to be creating values that are viable for us. In other words, we're not just gonna choose things willy-nilly. We're going to be creating values that actually are serviceable for us and work for us. This is very much like saying that there is going to be music that resonates with us, something that we genuinely love, something that we genuinely feel uh, works for us. And that's not something that you can fake. 
that's something that if it works, it works and you know that it works. And so there are themes that work. And for instance, I've actually argued that uh, Christian themes still work in stories and movies for people now. And so if Nietzsche is right that the you know foundational components of the metaphysical worldview for, for modern people have, if that's changed, that's all well and good, but it's still the case that the stories appeal to people. People still like Christian themes. We still watch movies that involve Christian mythology and angels and demons and, and the whole nine yards. So that in itself is kind of interesting. So Campbell gives us a, a little bit more to chew on here in saying that a living mythology is one that lives and breathes. It's one that is capable of expression in the lived experience of day-to-day -day life for people. It's something that you actually can live through and live in. In other words, it's not just something that you believe, but it's something that you can actually enact and live as part of your life. And uh, there are kind of echoes of Kierkegaard here, but I, I want us to, you know, stay focused on Nietzsche and the the idea of um, the idea of creating. So, what we're really talking about in the context of Campbell, as picking up from Nietzsche, is creating of one's own mythology. And how do you do this? Well, he's a little bit light on the details of that as well. It's not a trivial thing, right? What kind of artistic expression is going to actually work for you, is going to fit for you and serve the function of religion, or at least be capable of uh, living through that thing in your life? Not a trivial thing, not an easy thing, but Nietzsche gives us some, some food for thought here in terms of, let's say, uh, people who claim to be Druids and worshiping the mother goddess or polytheists and believing in the Greek gods or something of the kind. Is that possible? Is it possible for someone to do that in the same way that it would have been possible in millennia past? And Nietzsche is going to say no for the reasons that I described earlier with respect to our fundamental way of seeing the world, the way that we have been molded and shaped by culture, society, language, and so on, has put us in a position where that may not arguably be a viable option for us anymore. Now, is there a form of it that might be useful? Yeah, that that's a totally different story. But could we believe as ancient Christians believe? Could we believe as ancient Druids believe? Now we're really talking about a long time ago. Nietzsche is going to say no. So, that, I think, is, uh, is kind of interesting and, and worthwhile. Now, ultimately, we've got to ask the question, right? Was Nietzsche right about this? Is, is he just right that there are certain options that are not open for us today that would have been open in previous times? Well, it's worth examining what life was actually like for someone who is a practitioner of ancient Greek polytheism, ancient Roman polytheism. And that's another issue for another time. Did the Greeks believe in their gods? You know, what did they actually do with their religion? What was that like? What was it like to be a medieval Christian? That's, that is an interesting, um, that's an interesting idea. But what I want to suggest to you is, I'm not going to give you an answer on that, right? I'm not just going to come out and say, yeah, he was right about that. No, it's, it's not that simple. Um, what I am going to say, is that I think Nietzsche's idea is useful. And regardless of what it is that we think about it, whether it's exactly right, whether it needs modification, surely it does, because all ideas do, it's useful. It's provocative for thought and characteristic for this channel. It's good to think with. And that's really the best that we can hope for. And maybe in the Nietzschean age, maybe that's the best that any of us can ever hope for instead of being able to get things absolutely right and get that absolute certainty that a rationalist would want, if that dream has died as well, then maybe this is the best that we can do. Regardless, I hope the ideas are useful for you. I hope they've been good to think with. See you next time.